So like Brooke said, this is the series and this is the scope of the series. We did, uh, last week we did the philosophy of power uh, and this tonight is how to do things with words, but you can see where we're going here. We're gonna do sex, uh, ethnicity, sex and gender, ethnicity, technology. We're gonna do uh, money, power and money. I don't know if we'll come up with anything to say there. Um, marketing. Uh, institutions, um, education, and then we're going to we're going to end with power in the individual. So let's get to it. Some of you may know this piece, Rene Magritte. Uh, it's a pipe, right? Um, and it's it's a fairly good representation of a pipe. Uh, it's got shadow and light, a light source, and. Um, yeah, it's pretty, not much of an art piece, is it? <laughs> Just a pipe. Except it isn't a pipe. Uh, this is the actual painting. So many of you will know. Ceci n'est pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. And this is what he says about it. The famous pipe, how people reproached me for it. And yet, could you stuff my pipe? No, it's just a representation, is it not? So if I had written on my picture, this is a pipe, I would have been lying. So what this is about is the gap between representation and reality, or more accurately, for Magritte and for our subject tonight, it's about the nature of reality itself, which is linguistic, symbolic, rather than anything else that we'll talk about. Now this, this connects to what we talked about last time with the dialogue in Plato's Republic by Thrasymachus, who gets painted as a sophist, as someone who doesn't believe in anything. Well, that's not, that's too much, that's a nihilist. Uh, it, sophists get the reputation that they don't believe in absolute truth, and, when, when you don't believe in absolute truth, many people will say to you, well, you don't believe in anything, far from it. Um, in fact, I would suggest that most people don't believe in absolute truth, they believe in relative truth. They believe in truth that comes as a result of your daily life and the constructions you make of it. Truth is socially constructed. I think that's what we live. We talk a lot about other kinds of truth, but Magritte goes right into that scene uh, because he says, this is not a pipe, and he's right. It's not. As he says, can you stuff this pipe? No. And yet it is a pipe. We recognize it immediately as a pipe. And so it's a symbol. It's a representation. It's a sign. It's a thing created in the world that corresponds, at least mentally, to something in the world that we know. But what's important here is the representation itself, as Magritte will show you later. Now he's really messing with you. So this is a painting of this is not a pipe and a painting of the painting being painted. <laughs> okay, again, his point here is he's a surrealist, surrealist, over reality, hyper reality. We talk about this a lot here. Simulation and simulacrum. We can call it whatever we want, but I think it's what we live. We live in a world of representation. We work with representation. We work with language. And we work with words. So tonight, how to do things with words. Why are we focusing on this? Well, I'm going to take you through a couple of philosophical, well, psychological, philosophical statements about why we work with words. And the reason is there's nothing else between us. There's no other connection between us. This is the great uh, and wonderfully weird psychiatrist R.D. Lang who says this, we are separated from and related to one another physically 
like we can see each other, right? You can hear me. Persons as embodied beings relate to each other through the medium of space, right? And we are separated and joined by our different perspectives, separated and joined by our different perspectives, educations, backgrounds, organizations, group loyalties, affiliations, ideologies, socioeconomic class interests, and temperaments, etc. These social things that unite us are, by the same token, so many things, so many social figments that come between us. Figments, socially created things, like words, that come between us. If we could strip away, but if we could strip away all the exigencies and contingencies and reveal to each other our naked presence, what would you have? If you take away everything, all the clothes, the disguises, the crutches, the grease paint, and also the common projects, the games that provide the pretexts for the occasions that masquerade as meetings, if we could meet, if there was such a happening, a happy coincidence of human beings, what now would separate us? And Lang says, no thing, nothing. There is no thing between us. Between us, nothing, he says. That which is really between cannot be named by any of the things that come between. The between itself is no thing. Stay with me. Uh, the Russian philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin says something very similar. He's talking about, it's an essay called Author and Hero in Aesthetic Activity, but you don't have to get into all that. All he's talking about here, as you'll see, is how we see each other and what that process is like. So he says this, when I contemplate, this is Mikhail Bakhtin, when I contemplate a whole human being who is situated outside and over against me, so see, same thing Lang is talking about, our concrete, actually experienced horizons do not coincide. What does he mean? Well, for at each given moment, regardless of the position and proximity to me of this other human being who I'm contemplating, I will always see and know something that he from his place outside and over against me, cannot see himself. Parts of his body um, are, in, sorry, are inaccessible to his own gaze, for example. If we're sitting across from each other, as we are right now, um, your head, your face, your expression, you can't see. And you should see it right now. It's like, what is he talking about? Uh, you can't see your own face right now without some aid. You can't see behind you. There's a whole series of objects and relations which are accessible to me, like I can see you all, and I can see the space between you, but you can't see it, at least, especially the way I see it. All right. In order, he says, that this bud, this, this bloom of seeing, of understanding, of knowing, fills and folds into a consummating form. The excess of my seeing, that is what I can see that you cannot see, must fill in, right? Consummate the world. It must fill in our horizons. And you must do the same with me. <laughs> you can't see what's behind me. I can't see what's behind me. I can't see my face, but you can, is what I'm trying to say. So we have this mutuality, right? Where together, we see a lot more, is what he's saying. And his famous line is, um, I don't want to drag you through too much of this because it's really dense, but the famous line is, as we gaze at each other, two different worlds are seen in the pupils of our eyes, right? Are reflected in the pupils of our eyes. So as I gaze at you, I see you, your world, and if I could see the reflection in your eyes, I could see my world. And together, we would have a whole other world. What is this connection? Bakhtin says, I must put myself in his place. And after returning to my own place, fill in his horizon through that excess of seeing which opens out from this, my own place outside him. I must inframe 
this person, create a consummating environment for him out of this excess of my own seeing, knowing, desiring, and feeling. All right, so what does that mean? That means that while there is no thing between us, we still connect. In fact, for Bakhtin, it is essential to epistemology, to knowing that we need each other and we need each other's seeing. Your unique perspective in the world and we combine those perfect perspectives and we get a vision of the world that's not available to us alone or even in smaller groups. What is this? What is it we're talking about? We're talking about words and in the ancient world this was called rhetoric. And again, the sophists in Plato's dialogues are the masters of rhetoric. And that's seen by Plato as a bad thing. Because uh, it, it's analogous, I don't know if you've read the New Testament, but uh, you've probably heard of the Pharisees, right? Bad, right? They were actually a fairly, fairly liberal group at the time of Jesus. They were kind of open. Um, to many interpretations of the Bible, and they were not especially political, but they get tagged with being the uptight uh, conservatives who basically killed Jesus. Right? So Plato's doing the same thing with the sophists. He's setting them up as those, it's, they're foils, and a foil is a great thing to have, right? Just listen to any politician. He or she will explain to you what she, he or she is not. I'm not like her. I'm not like him. Right? So you define yourself against something. It's a very effective rhetorical technique. Uh, but, but it's also many times just a straw man, which is another rhetorical uh, phrase. It's not the person you're actually seeing. Right? It's a conjecture in your own mind that you've created, a projection of your own mind that you've created in order to basically have that person serve as a mirror for you. But, but it's not, it doesn't work because you're only seeing what you pro projected already, right? So what can happen is if you understand the power of words and if you approach it in the ways we're going to talk about tonight, then you learn. You learn about other people. You learn about the world and ultimately you learn about yourself and that is power. To understand the tissue that connects us all, which is made of words and signs and symbols. To understand that may be the greatest power there is. I don't know, we'll talk about it. I remember uh, my dear mentor in my dissertation, um, a wonderful man, a romantic study of romantic poetry. And uh, we had met, we were meeting right after 9-11 and he's like, what are we doing? What are we doing talking about William Blake and Yates? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, look what happened. They, they blew up those buildings. The buildings came down. What should we do? And I'm like, we should be talking about language, right? Language is the medium for everything. It's the medium for everything. So if you know language, then you have power, right? And I don't know if you've ever read the 9-11 report, but it's, it's, a, it's a government report, but it's rather amazing. I think I've mentioned this before. After 9-11, uh, the government uh, put together a commission, the 9-11 commission, and they produced an actual report and actually used it in a class because it was so well written. And the main conclusion is that 9-11 happened not because of bigotry, not because of, I mean, it happened because of those things, but the larger, deeper cause was a lack of imagination. Well, imagination is made of words. It's made of symbols. It's made of language. And the ancient rhetoricians, the ancient sophists knew this. Uh, actually, I think they were so powerful because they had mastered language and knew how to manipulate the medium. That's why Plato felt the need to destroy them, which was also a rhetorical move, and put forward his hero, Socrates, who is about truth. 
he seeks the truth. Thrasymachus, he's just talking. He's trying to trick you with words. And uh, well, so is Plato, so is Socrates, right? In fact, that's the genius of Thrasymachus in the Republic is that he calls Socrates on that very thing. He essentially says, you're just a better rhetorician, a rhetor, they call it. You're a better rhetorician than everybody else. So we're all rhetoricians. We're all sophists. <laughs> this was so important, the study of rhetoric, the power of words, was so important that it was one of the three essential arts in the Middle Ages and Renaissance that had to be taught grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So uh, grammar is um, basically analysis, is how they understood it then. It's the ordering of facts into reality. We might even call it science. Um, it's a, it's a, yeah. Well, and then there's logic, too. Grammar is kind of organization. Logic is obviously systematic thinking. And rhetoric is communicating all this. Um, so those are the three skills that the medieval and the Renaissance world thought were so essential. They called them the trivium. And now they're going to tell you that all that feeds into theology, the handmaiden of the science, of the, yeah, of the sciences. Um, but the way you get there is through these three qualities, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. There's also the quadrivium, the, another four um, subjects, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And with that, in the medieval world and in the Renaissance world, you covered every piece of knowledge there was with those four disciplines. All right. So let's just, let's see how this worked. Let's see how the power of words works. And um, lots of people have written and spoken about this. And let me give you a sense of the scope of what they've said from the ancient world until now. By the way, I thought there is such a thing as visual rhetoric. And I thought Magritte would be a good representation of that tonight. So all our art tonight comes from Rene Magritte, that wonderfully weird Belgian surrealist. The first person to write about rhetoric was, of course, Aristotle. He says, rhetoric is the counterpart of dialectic. So dialectic is what Plato did, what Socrates did. And Aristotle says it's the counterpart. Uh, so unlike Plato, Aristotle says, no, it's, you need both. Plato wants you to think that dialectic is the only way to truth or to meaning. Aristotle says it is the faculty of discovering any particular case, in any particular case, all of the available means of persuasion. So rhetoric is about persuasion. Persuasion is a synonym for power. Because if you can persuade someone to do something, then you have power over them. Cicero, rhetoric is one great art comprised of five lesser arts. Uh, Aristotle loved to break things down into parts, and so those who follow Aristotle's tradition and rhetoric love to do that. I'm not going to mention the parts. They're in Latin and all that. Quintilian, rhetoric is the science of speaking well, the education of the Roman gentleman, both useful and a virtue. St. Augustine, rhetoric is the art of expressing clearly, ornately, where necessary, because you don't want to be too ornate, persuasively and fully the truths which thought has discovered acutely, right? Pr uh, expressing clearly and persuasively the truths that have been discovered through dialectic, uh, Augustine would say. Francis Bacon, rhetoric is the, the application of reason, I like this, the application of reason to the imagination for the better moving of the will. The application of reason to the imagination. There it is, the imagination for the better moving of the will. It is not solid reasoning of the kind science exhibits. Okay, so Bacon's going to say that given his time and place and what, what he does, what he contributes to the world. But still, I like that, the application of reason to imagination because he recognizes the importance of the imagination which is actually derided by Plato. I don't know if you remember this from college, if you went 
and um, read the Republic, but there are no poets allowed in the Republic. Sorry. More contemporarily. Wow. I know. We, we could talk about that. <laughs> um, yeah. You okay? Okay. Well, I think that was Magritte's goal. But there, there's a lot there because obviously the visual rhetoric here is that when men see women, they don't see their faces, they see their bodies and especially their sexuality. Um, there's also the, the neck and the face are phallic and the hair is different, almost like pubic hair. So there's this, I think that's why he calls it the rape is there's a sense of penetration there. How to do things with words and images, right? Contem more contemporary, I.A. Richards, a great literary critic, rhetoric is the study of misunderstandings and their remedies. Maybe that's a good image, <laughs> misunderstandings and their remedies. Richard Weaver, 1948, rhetoric is that which creates an informed appetite for the good. It's very positive. Kenneth Burke, whom we're going to come back to. Rhetoric is rooted in an essential function of language itself, a function that is wholly realistic and continually born anew. The use of language as a symbolic means of inducing cooperation in beings that by nature respond to symbols. Wayne Booth, whom we're going to use for the remainder of the talk. Rhetoric is the art of discovering warrantable beliefs and improving those beliefs and shared discourse. See, there's the, the need to interact, to see what others see, to consummate the world. The art of probing, probing, he continues, what we believe we ought to believe, what we believe we ought to believe, right? Rather than proving what is true according to abstract methods. Rhetoric is not mathematics. Uh, rhetoric is too human for that. Rhetoric, this is Lloyd Bitzer who wrote uh, a well-known article about rhetoric. Rhetoric is a mode of altering reality, not by the direct application of energy to objects, but by the creation of discourse which changes reality through mediation of thought and action. Jacques Derrida, we should not neglect rhetoric's importance as if it were simply a formal superstructure or technique exterior to the essential activity. Rhetoric is something decisive in society. There are no politics, no society without rhetoric, without the force of rhetoric. Andrea Lunsford, rhetoric is the art, practice, and study of all human communication. Mark Fumaroli, rhetoric appears as the connective tissue peculiar to civil society and to its proper finalities, happiness, and political peace. Political peace, that's what it says. All right, so let me, I'm going to let Wayne Booth, who, whose book, The Rhetoric of Rhetoric, is really, he's, he's a, a, an authority or was an authority on rhetoric, and uh, one of his last books was The Rhetoric of Rhetoric. And uh, he lays it out pretty nicely here. So for Aristotle, going back to Aristotle, and everybody plays off of Aristotle one way or another because Aristotle wrote the first text on rhetoric and on poetics, by the way, or drama. Um, he says, Aristotle says, that there are three modes of persuasion, and I think you'll you'll recognize these. There's, the, there's ethos, pathos, and logos, and you may be having flashbacks to college. I don't know, if, did you go over this in college? Or, yeah, ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos is pretty simple, it's the ethic of the speaker. It's, it's uh, the character of the speaker, and so um, if I wanted to play my ethos card right now, I might put up my doctoral diploma. Right? Except that would be a very bad rhetorical move, <laughs> right? Because it would come off uh, as weird and inappropriate, and it would be. Um, that's the general 
sense of ethos, uh, but there are particular tactics, of course, that go along with it. Um, so for example, I, I, I should know my audience. This is what I love about Aristotle, he's incredibly practical. I shouldn't, um, in fact, I've seen a lot of colleagues do this at conferences, they give up and give a talk and there's, they're just in their head, you know, and, and they're not even aware, really, that there's an audience in front of them. And so uh, you've probably been, you've probably listened to talks like that and it's like, wow, okay, thanks for letting me inside your brain for 20 <laughs> minutes, uh, I need a drink. <laughs> There's pathos, which is the Greek word for suffering uh, or emotion, and this is an emotional appeal. So this is what you get in political rhetoric, obviously, is emotional appeal. Um, well, you get it all. Uh, you get the appeal to ethos, the standing of the speaker. I'm the president, or I'm the so-and-so, and therefore you must listen to me. That's cheap rhetoric. and. Um, Anybody who knows rhetoric would recognize it. Not everyone does. Um, so and then there's emotional appeal. They're coming over the border to kill you. Uh, <laughs> you know, in waves. There are waves of caravans of people coming and they're going to kill you. Um, I don't know if they take your job. I guess they take your job, then they kill you. Uh, but you get the idea. Uh, to induce fear or excitement or even love in someone is a mode of rhetoric, mode of persuasion. And then you can't really, well, I guess you can. I was going to say you can't be persuasive without logic. Uh, let me correct that. Uh, you're actually more persuasive. Now remember that uh, Bitzer and Booth uh, talk about this, talk about rhetoric as the generation of reality. Um, <clears throat> R.D. Lang talked about this too, as did Mikhail Bakhtin. So, so what, I want to be clear about what we're saying here. We're not talking about words reflecting reality. We're talking about words generating reality, okay? That's what rhetoric is. That's the deep philosophical notion. And so, there are three ways in rhetoric of making these realities. The deliberative, uh, so politicians or committee members might debate on how to vote and what to do to make an action that affects the future that's deliberative and the idea is that you're planning something. Uh, forensic is about the past, what you did wrong, what we did wrong, what you shouldn't have done, here's why, it's forensic, uh, it's obviously connected to law, but it's also connected to history, uh, forensic rhetoric. Here's what went wrong and why, and here's who's to blame, and what should be done to him, right? And then epideictic rhetoric is rhetoric of the present. It's what, it's what you get at a funeral. It's what you get at a wedding. It's simply about the present and understanding what that understanding what's happening in that moment, in that moment. Remember the others are about past and future, this is about the present. So that's why I mentioned uh, wedding. So when you say I do, that's what philosophers call a speech act. It's a speech that is an action. I now pronounce you husband and wife. Well, I pronounced it. So there it is. When you become a member of Congress, you must take an oath. You say it. This is epideictic rhetoric. It's happening in the present. It can have a uh, deliberative orientation, certainly for the future. I will protect and pr defend the Constitution of the United States, but that's, it's really about what's happening now. And it, it's really concerned with speech acts. Um, if you're interested in this, J.L. Austin is the philosopher. Speech acts. Words that do things. Um, verdicts, for example. You are now guilty. All right. Now, this is where, those are the kinds of rhetoric and the modes of persuasion. This is where it gets interesting, I think. And this is uh, Wayne Booth. Kinds of rhetoric, according to Booth. When rhetoric, all right? So there's the honest kind of win rhetoric, 
All right, Where, and this is, this is the statement, the intention, the, the person using the words, this is what she thinks. My goal is to win because I know that my cause, my case, my convictions are right. My opponent's cause is absolutely wrong and my methods, my methods will be sincere and honest. All right, that's win rhetoric. It's about winning, but it's also about a way to that goal which is sincere and honest. Uh, there's disingenuous rhetoric, he calls it. My cause is absolutely justified, therefore I will win at all costs, even the cost of my integrity. And so, I think we've all been there. I'm gonna do this, it's still the right thing, but I'm, I'm not so concerned. In fact, I'm willing to be disingenuous in my methods. And then there is the outright dishonest win rhetoric. I know my cause is unjust, <laughs> but winning will be profitable to me. And I'm so skillful that nobody will realize my deceptions. Wow, this, <laughs> okay, that sounds really present. Um, I know that my cause is unjust, but winning will be profitable to me, and I'm so skillful that nobody will realize my deceptions. I will employ what Wayne Booth calls retrickery. I don't know, that. retrickery? I will employ retrickery that appears to be honest. So this is not just one politician, this is uh, many, many, many politicians, all right? Uh, so it has to do with the aim and the method. Right? Win rhetoric. Bargain rhetoric. Now, this, see, nobody's talked about this but Booth. I find this really interesting. Everybody else, most everybody else is just repeating Aristotle. There are three modes of rhetoric, and, you know, there's three rhetorical situations, ethos, pathos, logos. Booth goes, I think, very pragmatic on this. Uh, bargain rhetoric. Dialogic. I want to avoid violence by... <laughs> pr uh, vi verbal violence or actual violence by achieving productive compromise. Okay, I want to avoid violence or violent disagreement by achieving productive compromise. So you're willing to compromise. Uh, and in fact, you want to do that to avoid a negative situation no matter how much you believe your, ca your case and your cause. There is uh, acquiescence. I'll compromise even if I know that the result is evil. I won't stand up to the enemy. So you talk about the issue, uh, but you, you compromise because uh, for various reasons you don't feel strong enough, powerful enough, inclined enough to, f to do rhetoric, to, f to carry on with your rhetoric, to fight longer. You acquiesce, you give up. Um, disengagement. I want to bargain, I want to engage in bargain rhetoric. I want to engage in the back and forth, the dialogue, exploring the connections between us. I want to do that, but I don't know how. So I'll simply say yes, and not let you see my hopes. This can be bad because the cause is right or wrong. Um, and it's interesting because uh, Booth likes to use the examples here. This, this book is from 2000, early 2000s, so his examples are the Gulf War, the Iraq War, and the rhetoric surrounding the Iraq War, which seems quaint now. Um, but you remember this, right? There are weapons of mass destruction, we must go in. Um, and, and then all the rhetorical positions surrounding that. All right, now, this too, I think is, I've never heard before and I wanted to share it with you because I think it's, it's a whole new kind, a whole new aspect of rhetoric that is really helpful. He calls it, Booth calls it listening rhetoric. Listening rhetoric. So listening rhetoric is, I'm not just seeking a truth, I'm not, uh, a truce, sorry, I'm not, seeking acquiescence, I'm not trying to avoid discomfort, I'm not trying to avoid violence or verbal, strong verbal disagreement. I want to pursue what's behind our differences. This is Bakhtin. 
This is the, the hypothetical person in Bakhtin's um, conception who wants to fill in the horizon of his world by using the horizon of someone else who can see what he can't see. This is that listening rhetoric. So there's the listening rhetoric of hope. I have reason to hope that my opponent will respond to my invitation for both of us to engage in genuine listening. Does that happen anymore? Is, is social media something that has destroyed that? Or does media do things to us at all that we don't do ourselves? In other words, do we blame the technology or do we blame ourselves if this seems like a wild hope to be able to have listening rhetoric where I want people to engage with me in genuine listening and I'm going to start it by listening myself. I honestly think that's possible. I think it probably happens quite a lot. I was going to say most of the time. Maybe not most of the time, but quite a lot. But we'll, we'll talk about this when we get to technology. One of the things technology can do is also create realities, right? Or at least aid other rhetorics in the creation of their realities. And so social media becomes, through technology, becomes a certain way of speaking, a certain way of being in the world because, again, this is creating reality. Um, I left Facebook many years ago. Many years ago? Yeah, several years ago. And um, I'm like, I just, I don't like where this is going. This was like 2012. I'm like, I don't like where this is going. And I remember they ask you, well, first of all, they won't let you leave. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I don't know if it's still the case, but when I left Facebook in 2012, I said, oh, you don't want to do this. <laughs> And I'm like, yes, I do. And then it said, well, look at all these people who won't know anything. I'm like, really? <laughs> Gave me a list of my friends, implying that I'd never see them again. <laughs> that wasn't necessarily incorrect. Because of the medium, right? Because of the technology. And then, it, and then I had to go through like three more steps. And I was like, dude, I'm done. I'm out. Quit. Leave me alone. Um, so then, well, the reason I did it is because I thought the people, you know, I would care about, who, who I want to keep talking with, know how to reach me outside of Facebook, through other technology, but not social media. Um, but imme and immediately I heard from those people, are you okay? Uh, what's wrong? I'm like, I, I just left Facebook, I'm fine, how are you? Well, I didn't see you on Facebook, and so I thought maybe something had happened. Something did happen. I, you refused to participate. <laughs> I refused to participate in the medium any longer. And so that was a kind of death to them and to me. But I rose again. <laughs> so there is that, and I, I, would, I would hate for us to give up on this kind of listening rhetoric simply because we've got a technology, I was going to say highlights, negative rhetoric, it, that's too soft, it needs to be strong. We have a technology that demands uh, a certain kind of rhetoric that is, that is not listening rhetoric, it's far from it, right? Um, now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter, but uh, I spend most of my time there curating, <laughs> so I'm trying to keep things out, you know. Um, anyway, we can talk about this. There is listening rhetoric that involves doubt, of course. The, the person would say to herself here, according to Booth, though I'm quite, unsh I'm quite sure that my opponent is determined to ignore my case, I will listen to his, hoping to discover some way to engage him and genuine dialogue. All right, that's, we've all been there, right? I'm quite sure that my opponent is determined to ignore my case. I will listen to his hoping to discover some way to engage him in genuine dialogue. This is every customer service call, isn't it? 
look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this goddamn call. I'm going to push these buttons or say these things, and I'm going to wait 15 minutes because I have this hope <laughs> that, that you'll listen to me because, look, I'm listening to you. I'm taking my time. I'm punching all the buttons. I'm jumping through your hoops. I'm going through your maze. This is going to pay off, right? <laughs> There is disingenuous listening. I know, and the person would say this, according to Booth, I know that only by listening closely to my opponent can I hope to outsmart her. <laughs> and thus, I get what I want, uh, no matter what it costs her. So it's kind of predatory listening. Right? There is surrender. Surrender rhetoric, or what Booth calls self-censorship. I think you'll recognize this too. Unless I give in, says the imaginary um, surrender rhetorician, unless I give in and pretend to have been persuaded, I will suffer a certain consequence. And I don't want to suffer that. So I pretend to listen. I pretend to have been persuaded. I don't know, but I have a feeling this might be gendered. Um, maybe women do this more than men out of a sense of survival. I don't know. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, because you're, you're having to listen to men so much. Uh, unless I give in and pretend to have been persuaded, I will suffer a bad consequence. Disaster. <laughs> Disaster rhetoric. I'll be so committed to my listening dogma that I will insist on it, even when I can see that the results will be both disastrous for me and for others. Listen to me, damn it, because I'm listening to you. Can't you see I'm listening to you? You must, yeah, surrender, uh, disaster rhetoric. I'm going to make listening a weapon and I'm going to use it against you. And then this one, we, we come up against this one a lot, I think. Um, Self-censorship or accommodation. So, and this, let me just read Booth to you on this. Perhaps the most challenging problem faced by anyone embracing listening rhetoric, he calls it LR. I'm like, come on. Um, LR, anyone embracing LR. And pursuing ethical distinctions is the fact that all effective rhetors, speakers, must alter their rhetoric, at least to some degree, in order to hit the audience they think is there, whether or not they've actually listened. Isn't that immoral? Shouldn't one say that the only honest rhetoric is the kind uttered in total sincerity by the rhetor, with no tricky self-censorship altering techniques or emotional appeals. Now this is very, as he says, tricky. So there was a time in my life when I decided to be honest. <laughs> Did not go well. <laughs> uh, so I would tell people what I was thinking and wow. <laughs> and it was out of the sense of, you know, listening rhetoric and not, not being disingenuous. I was I'll take the rest up with my therapist, but there was a, I just couldn't, I couldn't stand the thought that I was not being truthful. And, and so I would be too truthful. Like, oh my God, I said things I still think of, and I'm like, what were you thinking? Well, I know what I was thinking. I was trying to be a, a good rhetor and not be disingenuous, but I ended up being an asshole in the process. <laughs> And of course, there's the other side of it, where um, you censor yourself because, well, for any number of reasons, but in that process, you become disingenuous because you don't speak your truth. And I think that's pretty common among all of us. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that it's built into the society um, to not only political institutions, but churches and schools, 
families that that you must censor yourself you must not speak your truth uh, even a little bit or you will face as he says consequences negative consequences for it um, yeah so you know it's really sad but people live their whole lives like that I think the generation before us probably uh, maybe a couple of generations before us probably lived their lives like that in terms of um, things in the world there, there's just so many people who cannot speak their truth for a number of reasons and then of course there is we would be remiss if we didn't talk about media rhetoric now we're going to talk about this too when it comes to marketing our talk on marketing and Booth says this, um, he says there's uh, unconscious media rhetoric. You know, I'm not going to go into this because I think you know this. There are things that happen to us through media that are unconscious, right? So uh, something's playing in the background or in the foreground or whatever, and it's just seeping in, right? I'm told you can learn a language this way. I don't know. Um, but I think we know that now. Um, well, yeah. And then there's conscious stuff, money, politics, celebrity, uh, dogmatism, where um, you are bombarded, we are bombarded every day with somebody trying to sell us something from guns to God. Um, and, you know, that, takes an eff that has an effect, too, uh, because what you end up doing is, is just blocking. And in that process, you can block too much, and you can block the sacred you can block if not the sacred you can block just the opportunity to hear someone else through your listening rhetoric through Bakhtin's consummation of the world um, well we'll talk about that again with technology and marketing but it applies here is with so many arguments coming at you all the time about everything from buying a mattress to voting for a candidate there's a certain saturation that happens where you block out everything just to survive. I think you know what I'm talking about. Now, for the last slide here, and before we open it up for what is our usual amazing discussion, I wanted to introduce you to Kenneth Burke. And I say introduce you because he's, he's really too dense to, to try to talk about on one slide or even one whole talk. But he's really important, by the way. The, I don't know if you know this Magritte piece. Let's see. The words in French mean person bursting with laugh, laughter. That's one node, right? Horizon, all right. Wardrobe and cries of birds. <laughs> so it's actually a really interesting piece. I like it a lot because they're thinly connected, but they're their own worlds. But anyway. Kenneth Burt, he says this, wherever there is persuasion, there is rhetoric, and wherever there is meaning, there is persuasion. So his point is, uh, in his many books, and he was a poet, a philosopher, and a rhetorician, a literary critic, he was an amazing person. Wherever there is persuasion, there is rhetoric, wherever there is meaning, there is persuasion. The ultimate aim of our rhetoric as is our lives is to find meaning right meaning that's why dialectics is problematic because that's about truth and truth is not meaning there are many meanings there's only one truth for Plato for Socrates you move through the world trying to escape, actually escape the world you're living in because it's corrupt, it's false. And so you're constantly living in a lie. Well, I don't think that's any way to live. To assume that the world around you is corrupt and false, this is why I'm more of an existentialist. The world is absurd. Cool. <laughs> Let's make some meaning. Because the canvas is blank. I can make any kind of meaning I want. You know what else? 
I'm responsible for my meaning. I'm not just painting shit. Somebody's going to come along and say, is that your shit? <laughs> I have to say, yeah, I did that. That's existentialism. How'd I get on existentialism? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for Burke, <laughs> for Burke, meaning, he, he calls human beings homo symbolicus, the symbol using animal. Everything we do is a symbol. It's using symbols. And that's where meaning lies. And again, Plato's problem and the, the representation theory of language's problem is that there's something beyond the symbol. For Burke, and Lang, and Bakhtin, and many, many other people, including the ancient Sophists, no, no, the meaning is right where you are. It's not out here, it's not up there, it's not down the road, it's right here, right now, in your words. Meaning as symbolic action. And he says we, this, this tissue between us that Bakhtin and Lang talked about, this is, this is social meaning. Right? So, so you're not a solipsist. You're not off somewhere and you don't get to make up your own meaning. Sorry, you don't get to. You know why? Because you're using words. And words belong to everyone. And so you're using a shared medium and you can't, from that shared medium, create your own world. Because even the words you use, this is Bakhtin especially, even the very words you use are full of what he calls heteroglossia. They're full of other voices. He, he's brilliant. I encourage you to read him. He says each word tastes of the context in which it's been used. And that's right. We're using a shared me. It's like a freeway. We're all on the freeway. That's bad. That's, that's a bad example. Um, um, oh, I think you know what I mean. We're using a shared medium and so we we can adapt that medium, we can try to affect it, and we do affect it. You don't affect it as an individual, this is inherent, and this is Burke's point, this is inherently social. It's an inherently social enterprise. The power of words is inherently social uh, because we all share it. We all share language. All right, let me close up here. Um, the real question well, he says, I think this will be obvious to you. He has a concept called identification, which is basically, it's what religious studies scholars would call a totem, but he's bringing it into the <clears throat> current age. Um, you, have, you have things in the culture that you mark as reflective of you. Uh, the Golden State Warriors, or a certain political party, or a certain politician, or a certain music genre, or you know what I'm talking about. These give you your meaning, but you didn't create them. They're in the culture, right? Now again, you can adapt them, whatever, but you don't create them. That, he says, is identification. And rhetoric ultimately is really about simply asking, instead of what, what do words mean, or right, let me put it this way. In asking what words mean, you ask what they do. What do they do? What function do they have in the rhetorical situation? Look at social media in that light. Don't look at the words and think of their truth value. Think of their function. What's happening here? What are you doing, right? For example, uh, you'll see a lot of, well, I don't know, because you curate your own feed, but I see a lot of anti-Trump stuff. All right, you know, you can take that, whatever. Uh, about its truth value, you can argue about that, but what does that do? Well, what it does is for the speaker, the rhetor, the Twitterer, what it does is say, this guy's hurting me in some way. And I want to strike back. Pretty basic analysis, right? Else, why would I spend my time tweeting at a president who's not going to read it? 
You know what else you're doing? You're looking for community. You're looking for other people to go, yeah, like. <laughs> or even better, retweet. <laughs> and then what are you? You're, now you're not alone. You hate this guy too. And so again, I'm not saying you should do this solely because there are meanings behind the words, but I'm saying rhetoric is about the function of words, the power of words, the power of language. So look at what you're, what you're doing there. You're creating something in the world. You're creating a world in which you can live. So again, like an existentialist, you must own that world because you created it. All right, uh, I got to stop. Hang on. Um, rhetoric is power. Oh, right. I wanted to give you this Kenneth Burke quote because if you remember the last time we talked about the definition of power, the philosophy of power and what that was. And it was about capacity. And we went through this definition that, was, that went from very basic capacity or ability to mastery. Right? It, it took a really interesting turn, right? So it was just this ability, yeah, I can shoot a three-pointer to mastery. You know, I can sh th shoot a three-pointer right in your face. Right? And those are the, that's the spectrum of power. Burke says this, the use of words, rhetoric is the use of words by human agents to form attitudes or to induce actions. To form attitudes or induce actions in other human agents. Rhetoric is power. And then truth versus meaning. I've already hinted at this before. Um, I teach a class, uh, I actually begin a class this week at studio school downtown. We kind of work together, the, our university and them. And so I teach their philosophy class. And Thursday, I will be giving a lecture called Muthos versus Logos, Myth versus Truth. And I will tell them the story that many of you have heard before, forgive me for repeating, but this is a true story uh, about a missionary who went to see the Seneca in upstate New York in the, around the 18th century, early 18th century. And the missionary came to them and he gave the Seneca the gospel. And he says, there, you know, we were born, uh, we lived in a garden originally, and then, um, you know, there was this serpent. He was really smart and cunning. And he got us to eat, well, got the woman to eat, you know, you know the story. Um, and because of that, we were born in sin. But the good news is that there was a man who came, and he died for your sins. Because when you sin, you have to die. But this guy died for you. And now all you have to do is believe in him, and you can live. I, I would have loved to have been there. Wouldn't that have been great? Can you imagine? Because when you hear that story, it's like, that's a really weird story. But okay. So they say, awesome. That's the Seneca word, awesome. <laughs> and uh, they said, let us tell you a story. And so they tell the missionary a story about the origin of corn. Creation story. Seneca creation story. The missionary is pissed. He says, look, what I gave you was the truth. You gave me back fable and falsehood. And the Seneca are genuinely confused and slightly offended and they say, we believed your story, why won't you believe ours? We believed your story, why won't you believe ours? That's the difference between muthos and logos. Between truth and meaning. Because if there's truth, there can be only one truth. And if you have it, everybody else doesn't. And if it's the absolute truth, then you better do something about that. That you have the absolute truth. It might even be better to kill people than let them go on living a lie. Or even if you don't get that drastic, you've got to get these people to the truth. Because there's only one truth. If it's about meaning, 
if it's about how to make sense of my life in the world right now, just at this moment, that's all I need is this moment. We, we can believe that story. You want to hear another? Give me more stories. The more stories, the more meaning. Thank you for your attention.